Okay, welcome back everyone to Grockett's OGTV GMED Edition. My name is Jim Jacobson. That's my name in the upper right, along with a really tiny version of my picture. <clears throat> You're watching the, like I said, the GMED Edition, where we're going through the 12th edition of the guide to the test made by the actual makers of the test, question by question, cover to cover. And when we left off last time, we finished up question number 127, on, in the data sufficiency section on page 284. So we are going to pick up, still on page 284, with question number uh, 128. As always, I write down that uh, answer choice A is statement one alone, B is statement two alone, C is together. They are sufficient, but individually they are insufficient. D is uh, either one is sufficient on its own, and E is neither one is sufficient on its own, even in conjunction. They are still insufficient. So uh, as reminders that the answer choices are always the same. Okay, so uh, number 128, a school administrator will assign each student in a group of N students to one of M classrooms. If 3 is less than m, and that's less than 13, and that in turn is less than n, is it possible to assign each of these n students to one of the m classrooms so that each classroom has the same number of students assigned to it? So we find out that 3 is less than m is less than 13 is less than n. And the question is asking whether we can assign n students to m classrooms evenly. So really what it's asking is, is n divisible by m? A good question. There's not much we can do in advance of that, so let's take a look at the statements. Statement one says, it is possible to assign each of three n students to one of m classrooms so that each classroom has the same number of students assigned to it. So that tells us that um, 3n is divisible by m. But of course, um, and when we think about it, that is not necessarily sufficient because um, <clears throat> there are cases where two numbers, um, if, if we multiply n enough times, it might actually just be the common denominator of n and m. Um, so let's say that uh, m is 10 and m is, hmm, what would be a good example? So let's say m equals 10 and n equals 25. Well, 3n three, three is going to be a bad example, uh, but let's just say it had been 4n. Um, the or what would be a better example? Well, let's just let's just use this as an example so you can see what I mean. Um, in this case, n is not divisible by m, but a multiple of n, two uh, n, is divisible by m. M equals ten still. So um, just because three uh, n is divisible by m, it doesn't mean that m that n is divisible by m based on this problem. And I could pick a different number like uh, <clears throat> 12. Actually, that's a better one. m equals 12. Uh, n equals, <clears throat> excuse me, 18. So if m equals 12, which fits our problem, and n equals 18, n is not divisible by m, um, but 3, uh, 3n equals, um, oh, maybe I still did this wrong. Uh, for, oh no, that's right, 3n equals 48, and so 3n is divisible by m where n is not. So, but then we could pick a different number like the ones I just gave here where it doesn't end up being divisible with a 3m. Anyway, totally insufficient. So it's not a and it's not d. Statement two, it is possible to assign each of 13n students to one of m classrooms so that each classroom has the same number of students assigned to it. So 13n is divisible by m. And at first glance, it sounds like this is going to be similar to what we just discovered, that you know, just because the multiple of n is divisible by m, 
uh, that that's not necessarily true. <clears throat> but remember when you do the prime factorization of a number, let's say a number like 12, you say that that's you know, 2 times 6, and that 6 in turn is uh, 2 times 3. You break a number down in its, into its prime factors, um, and then the factors end up being 1, 2, 3, two of the other factors, 4, 6, another two factors, and 12. If we do that with 13n and do the prime factorization of that, of course we don't know what n actually equals. And so this is an example of where my explanation is going to differ a little bit from the one in the official guide. I actually find the official guide one kind of longer than it... Well, I don't know. I, my explanation makes more sense to me, or it's easier to understand. 13n has... We can tell it already has two factors because they're written right into the, into the number. It has two factors, 13 and n. We also know that since 13n is divisible by m, if we were writing down the factors down here, we'd have 13n at one end, we would have 1 at the other, and somewhere in here we have 13, and somewhere we have, we know that m is less than 13, and then somewhere else we have, and n is more than 13, so n is in here. There may be more numbers that are factors of 13n. Um, but again, since we factored out, uh, since the prime factorization of 13n is 13 and n, and we know that m is smaller than 13, and m is still a factor of it, m must be one of the factors of n. Because we know it's one of the factors from the original question, and it can't be a factor of 13 because 13 is prime and m is not 1. We know that m is greater than 3 from the original inequality. So m itself must be a factor of n, and if m is a factor of n, then n is divisible by m. Statement 2 is sufficient to tell us, yes, uh, this, that uh, n is divisible by m. So it's not c and it's not e, it is answer choice b. Interesting start to the questions on the page for the day. 284, question number 129. What is the median number of employees assigned per project for the projects at company Z? So we need the median number, which remember, it, with an odd number of numbers, the median number is exactly the middle one. And with an even number of numbers in your set, the median is the average of the middle two numbers in the set. So in order to find the median, we basically need the numbers in the set to solve it. That's pretty much all there is to it. So statement one, 25% of the projects at company Z have four or more employees assigned to each project. So 25% four or more. Of course, that doesn't tell us anything about the rest of the numbers, so clearly that can't be sufficient. We need the numbers on both sides of the middle, 25% being four or more, which is clearly the, you know, if we were to list all the numbers, this is the right-hand side of our ascending list of numbers. Um, this can't possibly be sufficient because we don't have the other side. Um, so it can't be A and it can't be D. <clears throat> Statement two. 35% of the projects at Company Z have two or fewer employees assigned to each project. 35% are less than or equal to two. Why did I just write three? It's two. I'm going to erase that. Two. There we go. Now again, this gives us only one side of those numbers. You know, when we, if we were to list all the, you know, the, all the numbers in our set. This only gives us the left-hand side, so it's not sufficient. So it's not B. Consulting the two together um, actually gives us a lot of information. Um, so if we were to list all the numbers in the set, and let's just say there's 100 projects going on at Company Z. Company Z is big and is doing lots of things with small teams of people. If, if there are 100 projects, that means that 25 projects have four or more people. So let's just pretend this is, so eventually for the remaining quarter of listing the numbers of, you know, teams of 
people on the teams, you start 25% um, have four or more. We also know that 35% have two or fewer, which is, you know, around a third. So let's just put it, you know, here, 35%. It doesn't matter that it's not exact. Um, so there would be two, two, two. I guess you could have some one, one, you know, projects in there too. So 35 plus 25 equals 60, which means that 40% of the projects are in the middle. Now, the only number possible for the middle between things that are four or more or two or less is three. So all the middle numbers are three, which means that the median of the set, which is what we're after, has to be three because at the 50%, the 50% mark is going to fall somewhere in this 40% here. Median is in here. And since those numbers are all three, these two statements are sufficient together. Answer choice C. Two eighty four, number one thirty. If Juan had a doctor's appointment on a certain day, was the appointment on a Wednesday? W question mark. It's, it's for my benefit as well as your own that I, I kind of try to summarize whatever the question is asking for because a lot of times uh, data sufficiency questions encourage you to do all sorts of figuring and it's easy to lose sight of what it is you're trying to figure out. So that's why I do that. In this case, was the appointment on a Wednesday? We need to know more about the appointment to make any sort of determination. Exactly, exactly 60 hours before the appointment, it was Monday. So 60 hours... That's a lot of hours. That's several days, in fact. That is um, 60 hours equals 5 times 12, so it's 5 half days or 2.5 full days. And so 60 hours before his appointment, it was Monday, which means since that it was two and a half days before his appointment and it was Monday, if... Um, so before noon, it, it, but we don't know when on Monday this took place, that this statement is true. So before noon, um, 60 hours later, is on a Wednesday. And this is before noon on Monday. Afternoon on Wednesday, two and a half days later, goes on to Thursday. So, um, without knowing when on Monday this 60-hour uh, thing is mentioned, uh, it's insufficient because there's more than one possible answer. So it's not A and it's not D. Answer choice, uh, or statement 2, tells us the appointment was between 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. Tells us nothing at all about the days, though. Nothing. So that can't possibly tell us whether his appointment was, was on Wednesday. I mean, there's a 1 in 7 chance, but you need a 100% chance for sufficiency on data sufficiency. So it's not B. In conjunction, though, clearly the two, two bits of information do provide us with what we need to make the determination. Um, statement 2 tells us that it's in the afternoon, between 1 p.m. and 9 p.m., well, afternoon slash evening. And we already determined that if it was afternoon on Monday, um, oh, well, the appointment, excuse me, the appointment is um, between 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. So, so if it's before noon on Monday, it's actually Wednesday p.m. This tells us then that the appointment is on a Wednesday because before noon on, on Monday, uh, two and a half days later is Wednesday afternoon slash evening, which is what statement two tells us. So the two statements together are sufficient. Answer choice C. Two eighty four, number one thirty one. When a player in a certain game tossed a coin a number of times, four more heads than tails resulted. Heads or tails resulted each time the player tossed the coin. How many times did heads result? So we need H equals uh, 
trace h equals what? We're also given an equation that the player tossed a coin a number of times and four more heads than tails resulted. So we also get heads um, equals the tails plus four. Now we only have one equation and two variables, so it's not enough to solve for h, but having one equation is a great start. If, they, if one of these answer choices gives us another equation, we will have sufficiency, another distinct equation, I should, I should say. Um, statement one, the player tossed the coin 24 times. That tells us that heads plus tails equals 24. That is a separate distinct equation. We could substitute this value for h. We could substitute t plus 4 in for h here. So that would be t plus t plus 4 equals 24. It would be 2t plus 4 equals 24. 2t equals 20, and t equals 10. We would need to be sure that we solve for h, um, and h is just t plus 4, so h equals 14. Um, this is just for your own sake to give you confidence that if you just see another distinct equation, you could say, yep, my shift's over, that one's sufficient. You wouldn't actually want to do this math unless you were doing really well on time. Um, anyway, statement one is sufficient. So it's not b, c, or e just on the basis of that one being sufficient. Statement two, the player received three points each time heads resulted and one point each time tails resulted for a total of 52 points. This gives us the equation three points for the heads plus um, one point for the tails, one t is the same thing as t, equals 52. Once again, having this equation here, h equals t plus 4, that can be substituted in here. I'm not going to do it again. I already demonstrated that you know two equations plus two variables equals sufficiency. So just know that you could put this right there, and you would have the whole equation in terms of t, and then you would add 4 to that final result of t, and you would get h. Statement 2 is also sufficient, so it is answer choice d. Either statement on its own is sufficient. Page uh, 284, number 132. What is the value of x plus y in the figure above? All right, let's try to get this figure. So the point of the kind of crooked lines is that we aren't dealing with a parallel lines situation. X, W, Y, and Z. And we need X plus Y. Uh-oh. Come on, give me my pen back. There we go. X plus Y equals what? So one of the first things to notice of course, is that we have a quadrilateral. Remember that the sum of the angles of any polygon um, is um, number of sides minus 2 times 180. Um, so in this case, 4 sides minus 2, the sum of the angles is going to equal 360. Some of the angles inside the box. So we may as well give them um, some letters. So we'll call this one A, this one B, this one C, and this one D. So um, that tells us that a plus b plus c plus d equals 360. And since uh, each of these pairs of angles, x and b, w and a, c and y, and d and z, form uh, straight lines, they are complementary angles, angles that add up to 180. So um, if we were to add up what... Um, w plus x plus y plus z equals, we could rewrite w as um, 180 minus a, because those two added together add up to 180. Um, x would be 180 minus b, y would be 180 minus C, and Z would be 180 minus D. 
all those 180s added together, um, of course we can we can do a little math there. That equals um, so this whole thing ends up so w. It simplifies to um, 720 minus a plus b plus c plus d equals w plus x plus y plus c. But we also know, remember, we know what a plus b plus c plus d equals. Those interior angles form a quadrilateral. They sum to 360. So we can say that 720 minus 360 equals w plus x plus y plus z. So finally, w plus x plus y plus z itself equals 360. We haven't even gotten to the statements yet, but that's pretty helpful because we just need x plus y. So if we can get um, w and z, we will know what x plus y equals and be able to answer the question. So let's take a look at the statements. Statement one tells us that w equals 95. We needed both w and z for sufficiency. I'll keep this in a different color to keep my markings clear. So we only got one of our two variables there, so statement one is insufficient, and that means uh, D is also not the answer. Statement two tells us that Z equals 125. Again, that's only one of the two variables that we needed to isolate X plus Y, also not sufficient. In conjunction, though, we can see that we get W and Z so we can rewrite this equation as 95 plus x plus y plus 125 equals 360. And that's the same thing as um, x plus y equals 140, which is the answer we needed. So these two statements together are sufficient. Answer choice C is the correct one not E. Two eighty four, number one thirty three. Are all of the numbers in a certain list of fifteen numbers equal? Well, we would probably actually need to know the numbers on the list to know whether they're equal. Um, fifteen numbers all equal? We shall see. Statement 1. The sum of all the numbers in the list is 60. So of course, um, you know, we don't, we don't know that all the numbers are different, so we could have 14 zeros and one number that's 60. We could have, you know, one, a few ones and some twos, and then, you know, a lot of ones and twos and then um, you know like 20 or 30 somewhere down the line without knowing um, what the individual numbers are we can't tell if they're all equal we just know that their sum is 60 and um, I mean we can tell that you know if the sum is 60 and there are 15 numbers on the list it tells us that the average is 4 but that doesn't really tell us what the individual numbers are. There's more than one way, more than one set of numbers that can produce an average of four. So it's insufficient. It's not A and it's not D. Statement two, the sum of any three numbers on the list is 12. Um, any three, the sum equals 12. The official guide gives basically a long mathematical proof of why this is, but basically it says that if, if you are choosing any three numbers and you are always getting 12, it means that each of the numbers has to be 4. So you know the, number, the list of numbers is 4, 4, 4, 4, 4. If there is zero chance of getting any sum other than 12, all the numbers must be 4. Um, I feel comfortable just stating that as a 
as a logical deduction without having to do it as a mathematical proof. If you're interested in the mathematical proof of why choosing any three numbers from a list of, of 15 numbers always has a sum of 12, um, the official guide has a mathematical proof in the explanation. However, I am comfortable saying since the, percent, the probability is 100% of getting a sum of 12 out of three numbers, um, any three, then all of them have to be four. So statement two is sufficient. Answer choice B. Last one on page 284, question number 134. A scientist recorded the number of eggs in each of 10 birds' nests. What was the standard deviation of the numbers of eggs in the 10 nests? So remember that standard deviation, um, so uh, the SD of 10 nests. Standard deviation is a computation of the average distance of every number in a set from the average. So the more spread out the numbers are, the more um, spread out, the, the higher the standard deviation will be from that average. The more clustered the numbers are, so you know a set like one, two, 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 three, three is going to have a much lower standard deviation than a set one. Um, I don't know. I guess I would have wanted one that had the same average, one, two, three, six, or something like that. Uh, my math didn't come out to be exactly right, but it's close. Anyway, since the numbers in the second set are more spread out than the first one, this one would have a higher standard deviation. Anyway, so we basically need to know something about the numbers in the set in order to be able to tell what the standard deviation is. We would also need, so we either need to know the numbers or, no, actually we really just need to know the numbers or things of, well, no, what I was going to say is we, we could also know something about the average and the dis the average distance of the of the numbers from the average, basically giving us the standard deviation. That would be another possibility. Statement one tells us the average or arithmetic mean number of eggs for the nests was four. So... While you do need to have the average when you compute standard deviation, that alone is not enough to tell you what the standard deviation is. You could have multiple sets with an average of four with different standard deviations. Um, I mean, just as an example, you could have the set zero and eight and the set four and four each of these has an average of four, but they would have different standard deviations because these guys um, have no standard deviation. They don't deviate from the average of the set at all, whereas these deviate the most, just as an example. So statement one is insufficient. Oh, I forgot to write these. It's not A and it's not D since statement one is insufficient. Statement two tells us that each of the 10 nests contained the same number of eggs. Without even knowing how many eggs are in each basket, um, we already established that um, if all the numbers are the same, the average is the same as all those numbers, you know, because it's the same number over and over again, you know, whether it's, you know, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, who knows. Um, if, if every number is the same, the average is 12, and the distance of every number in the set from 12 is zero. So the standard deviation itself equals zero. That alone is enough to tell us whether what the standard deviation of the set is. So statement two alone is sufficient, which makes answer choice B alone the correct answer. On to the exciting next page, the adventure that is page 285. Uh, I just kind of said that to be funny. I don't, I don't actually think that this page is any more adventurous than any of the other ones. It does seem to me that the questions do get harder as we go through each of the quantitative sections, uh, especially on the data sufficiency side. I feel like these questions on average are more challenging towards the latter half of the, of the numbers, but page 285 is not a point where things suddenly ratchet up in difficulty. Okay, 135. Uh, quadrilateral RSTU shown above is a site plan for a parking lot in which side RU is parallel to side ST and RU is longer than ST. What is the area of the parking lot? Wow, 
more of my awesome figure drawing. We get a vertical here. So we have R, S, T, U. This is 45. This is 15. And this is 60. OK. So a um, couple things that you can do. Uh, there is actually a formula for this type of figure. Um, and it's basically treating it kind of like you would a rectangle. So the area for uh, um, a figure like this with two parallel sides is basically taking this imaginary triangle here and flipping it over and putting it over here. Um, one half the top side length plus the bottom side length, these are the two parallel sides, times the height equals the area. And you can see that this is basically um, a plus B, where A is that top side and B is the bottom side, dividing that by two, that's basically taking the average of the two side lengths and multiply it times, times the height. You could actually use this as the formula for a rectangle. Um, it's just that A and B would happen to be the same, so you'd be doing a little bit of math unnecessarily. So if you happen to know that formula, you are set. You can just plug in the numbers. Um, well, we actually can't plug in the numbers. We don't actually know the length of RU yet, but um, alternately, if you don't remember that formula, you can draw in another, another imaginary um, uh, height, another vertical line, um, elevation. What's, is that the word I'm looking for? Anyway, you can turn it into two triangles plus a quadrilateral, um, a rectangle, as a matter of fact. So then you have the area of this, and then all you need to do is figure out, you know, uh, you would do one half the base times the height for this triangle. We actually have the base and the height for that one, and we know the base, or we know the height for this one. And then this would be length times width. So you would add these three areas together to figure out the area of the, um, of the figure if you don't remember this formula. So there's two ways to do it, and either one works. Let's see what the information in the statements gives us. Statement one tells us that RU equals 80. This provides the second full side length here. It tells us that this is 80. I'll put that in green. So we could actually use this formula here to do um, you know, 1 half of 80 plus, well, so, uh, one half of 80 plus 45 times 60 equals the area. I'm not going to do the actual math, but since it's all arithmetic, you know that we could. Um, we know that we could. We can mark statement one sufficient and cross off answer choices B, C, and E. Statement two tells us that TU equals 20 times the square root of 10 meters. So that's trickier. Um, 20 times the square root of 10. But um, again, with this imaginary um, height line here from T to, you know, we'll just call this X, um, we can figure out the area of this triangle and we can do basically that alternate method that I described for figuring out the area of the quadrilateral. We can figure out the area of this triangle here. We know the area of this rectangle here because um, we have the height and the, um, the width. All we need is the triangle, and we have two of the three numbers, so we can use the Pythagorean theorem. So the height is also 60 on this side. So uh, triangle, um, triangle TUX area would equal one half the base, which is XU, I guess, times the height, which is Tx. Oh, ugh, right. We would have that, uh, but we would use the Pythagorean theorem to figure it out, um, where or to uh, figure out what the third side is. So we know that. Uh, remember, with the Pythagorean theorem, if you have three sides, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So a squared can be sixty. So it would be sixty squared plus, and then this is xu, 
squared equals 20 times the square root of 10 squared, which then ends up being 3600 plus xu squared equals 4000. We subtract 3600 from both sides. xu squared equals 400, so xu equals 20. And then we would plug, we had tx equaled 60. This gets plugged in there. And we could figure out the area of the only part of the figure we were missing, figuring out the figure. So all that work tells us that statement two is also sufficient. It's not A, it is answer choice D. All right, 285, number 136. If the average or arithmetic mean of six numbers is 75, how many of the numbers are equal to 75? So we have six numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the average equals 75. So we need to know how many, if any, are equal to 75. Nothing we can do until we get to the statements. Statement one, uh, none of the six numbers is less than 75. So let's think about this for a moment. Um, what this means, remember when you have averages, you know, even if you have six numbers, um, whatever the average is, you know, the average is always whatever the, the middle, the middle, um, well, the average is the average which you can think of as the middle, but it isn't always one of the actual values in the set. For every one or two or three that you go up, you have to go one or two or three down somewhere in the numbers on either side of the average to keep the average balanced. Um, if you do not move up and down in the sum of these, or the, well, the average of these, then, then it changes the actual average. So if none of them is less than 75, and the average is 75, that also means that none of them can be more than 75. Because if, if all the numbers were either 75 or more than 75, the average could not possibly be 75 because there's nothing lower than 75 to balance it out. So statement one tells us that um, the numbers are in fact all 75. It is, you know, 75 six times. If we had any number more than 75, if we had like a 76 in here, the average would not stay 75 because none of the numbers are less than 75 to balance out that extra one there. So statement one is sufficient. It's not gonna be B, C, or E. Statement two tells us that number of the six numbers is greater than 75. Probably should have just written it out like that. And this tells us basically the same thing. If none of them are greater than 75, we can't have any less than 75 either and still have an average of 75. So statement two is sufficient. It is answer choice D. Either one is sufficient on its own to tell us that every number in this of the six numbers is 75. Two eighty-five. question number 137. At a bakery, all donuts are priced equally and all bagels are priced equally. What is the total price of five donuts and three bagels at the bakery? Five donuts plus three bagels equals who knows. In order to answer this question, we need to know what the prices are of donuts and bagels respectively, or be able to figure it out from the information we've been given. Answer choice, or excuse me, statement number one. At the bakery, the total price of 10 donuts and six bagels is 1290. 10D plus 6B equals 1290. 
So we could, of course, use these two equations and these two variables to do some kind of substitution or combination thing. It's actually easier just to notice that um, 10d plus 6b is two times 5d plus 3b. So it's just double what the question is actually asking for. So if we divide 1290 by 2, it equals you know 645. That's the price of 5d plus 3b, because it's just half of the 10d plus 6b price in statement 1. So statement 1 is sufficient. It's not b, c, or e. Statement 2. At the bakery, the price of a donut is 15 cents less than the price of a bagel. So um, D equals B minus 0.15, which is great, but it doesn't, if, without, wait, did I do that right? Donut is, yeah, fi donut is 15 cents less than a bagel. Without knowing, the, with, without knowing what the price of the bagel is, we can't compute both prices, and therefore we cannot um, solve for um, the, the equation. We cannot figure out what. Um, now, if, if we had actually gotten a total number in the original statement, um, 5d plus 3b equals some number, um, then the second equation would have been enough. But since we didn't actually get a full equation in the original problem, getting a full equation in statement 2 does not give us our two variables, two equations uh, standard. The first one wasn't actually an equation. Equals question mark is not an equation. Or if anything, it adds a third variable, in which case we would need a third equation. Make sense? Hope so. So statement number two is insufficient because there's multiple values for D and B in that case. Um, and it is not answer choice D, it is answer choice A. Statement one alone is sufficient. Still page 285, uh, number 138. I don't think we're actually, we're not actually going to get off of page 285. But we didn't start here, so we're still making great progress. What was the total amount of revenue that a theater received from the sale of 400 tickets, some of which were sold at X percent of full price and the rest of which were sold at full price? So those of you who've been following the broadcasts or just been doing a lot of work in the official guide, this is actually a lot like question 119. If you go back and look, it's another thing with a revenue in a theater selling 400 tickets, some of which were sold at a discounted price. So uh, I don't know if they fell asleep at the switch or just really like this particular problem as a, um, a thing to test you on. But um, it's not the same problem, but it's similar. Anyway, we have 400 tickets. And in order to know the revenue, it's going to equal a dollar amount. We need to know how many tickets were sold full price and how many were sold at discount. And we also need to know the price of each to figure out the total revenue for the theater. So prices and ticket numbers. Please, statements, give us what we need. Statement 1 tells us that x equals 50. Remember that x is the discount, so it's a 50% discount. But without knowing what it's actually discounting, like what the full price is, and without knowing the number of tickets sold each, you know, in each category, this can't possibly be sufficient. It doesn't give us the um, number of tickets and the number of discount or the dollar amounts. So it's not A and it's not D. Statement two, full price tickets sold for $20 each. Of course, that doesn't give us the discount price, and it doesn't give us ticket numbers for either type, so this cannot be sufficient either, so it's not B. Consulting the two in conjunction, it tells us that full price tickets sold for $20 put that there. And discount tickets were 50% off and they sold for $10. But there's multiple values, multiple, um, you know, let's say that F equals full and D equals discount. That tells us um, that 20 uh, F plus 10 D equals 
but we don't actually know the total dollar amount. Um, and we don't know the number of tickets. So we can't actually figure out the dollar amount. And there's multiple values of F and D that can give us, that we can add up to uh, 400 tickets and come up with different revenue numbers. And we need the exact number of revenue so the two statements together are insufficient. It is answer choice E. Neither one is sufficient on its own, nor are they sufficient together. Page 285, number 139. Last one in this column. Any decimal that only has a finite uh, that has only a finite number of non-zero digits is a terminating decimal. For example, 24, uh, 0.82, and 5.096 are three terminating decimals. If r and s are positive integers and the ratio r divided by s is expressed as a decimal, is r divided by s a terminating decimal? So, um, yeah, I guess without finding out what r and s are, um, we aren't going to be able to decide whether r divided by s is a terminating decimal or not. r divided by s equals terminating? Who knows? No man can say, at least until he gets to these statements. Statement 1, 90, or r is between 90 and 100. So 90 is less than r, which is in turn less than 100. So all this tells, so this is the numerator. This tells us what the numerator of the fraction is. So we can just pick a number like, um, you know, uh, 92. You know, if we divide 92 divided by 2, it ends up being 46 which is a terminating decimal. Uh, 92 divided by 3 is not a terminating decimal. Ends up being uh, 3.6, wait, uh, 330.666, going on to infinity. So uh, depending on what the denominator of the fraction is, the answer is either um, yes or no. And sometimes yes, sometimes no is not sufficient. So the statement is not sufficient. It's not A, nor is it D. Let's see what statement 2 gives us. Statement 2 tells us that S equals 4. So we know that R is a positive integer. Any number divided by 4 is going to have as its, um, if, even, if it, even if it turns out, even if it's a completely odd number, you know, so like uh, 91 divided by 4, um, which is, you know, um, going to give us a decimal. At worst, the decimal is going to end in 0.25. So if it's, um, you know, if it's being 90 and 1 fourth, it'll be 90.25, 90.5, or just a number that ends in 0 0.0. So, um, Dividing any integer by 4 gives us a terminating decimal. Statement 2 is going to be sufficient. So it's not C and it's not E. It is answer choice B. Next column, the penultimate question. 285, number 140. In the figure above, what is the value of x plus y? Time for drawing the figure above. Pretend that came to a point. y and x, we have a, b, c, and d. We need x plus y, these uh, two different angles of these two triangles. So statement one, um, statement one tells us that x equals 70. That tells us absolutely nothing. We don't know anything about the other two angles of the, of the triangle. I mean, it tells us that, you know, angle A plus angle C is going to equal 110. 
but that uh, doesn't tell us anything about why, um, and that's what we're after. So this is insufficient. It's not A and it's not D. Statement two. Um, triangles ABC and ADC are both isosceles triangles. So spelled it wrong. That's naughty. So the fact that they're both isosceles triangles is useful. It tells us that um, you know that two of the angles will be the same for um, and and two of the sides will be the same for each of the triangles. But statement two gives us no angle measures, so that can't possibly be sufficient. So it's not B. In conjunction, um, that tells us, for example, so x equals seventy, a plus c equals one ten. That tells us that angle A and angle C both equal 55 but it doesn't tell us anything about why now if it if they also if we also found out that um, you know line segment AD if we found out I'll mark them if AD and um, DC each bisected the angle that they are in like if, if CD bisected angle BCA uh, we could divide 55 by 2 and then figure out the value of y from there but since we don't have, you know, we don't know the proportion of this angle to this angle or of this angle to this angle, we can't figure out what y is, and we were asked to find out what is x plus y. And so, even in conjunction, the two statements are insufficient. Neither one is good for us. Answer choice E. Okay, last question, page 285, question number 141. Committee X and Committee Y, which have no common members, will combine to form Committee Z. Does Committee X have more members than Committee Y? Uh, X greater than Y? Let's find out. Statement 1. The average or arithmetic mean age of the members of Committee X is 25.7 years, and the average age of the members of Committee Y is 29.3. So age of x equals 25.7, age of y is 29.3. Average ages tell us nothing at all about the number of people on the committee. They could each be a committee of one or a committee of one million and, well, you know, any number in between or I mean, as long as we don't have negative numbers of people on the committees, um, or as long as we have non-zero numbers of people on the committees, if these numbers are true and tells us nothing about whether x is greater than y. Statement 1 is insufficient, which also allows us to cross off answer choice D, that either one is sufficient. Statement 2, uh, the average or arithmetic mean age of the members of, com of committee Z will be 26.6 age of z will be 26.6. That tells us again nothing. Average age tells us nothing about the number of um, committee members on each of the committees. You may start, <laughs> you may have started to wonder whether the GMET makers had lost their mind a little bit when they created this question. So statement two uh, state, uh, is incorrect or insufficient so it cannot be enough. We can cross off B. In conjunction though we find out something interesting. So um, what, when you uh, take the blending of the people on committee X and the committee of people Y into, into consideration, um, the average ages of each of them becomes a weighted average in a sense. If the committee members are the same, if they have the same number on X and Y, the age of the committee, the mixed committee, will be the straight average of their respective um, individual committee averages. So, um, 25.7 plus 29.3, um, 0, carry the um, 5, and then we divide that by 2,
So that tells us that if the committees were exactly the same number of people, the average age of the new committee would be the average of their two averages. The average age would be 27.5. When the uh, but if the committees are not exactly the same number of people, um, that will raise the average of the committee higher or lower. Note that the average age of committee X is younger than 27.5, and the average age of committee Y is older than 27.5. Um, what this means is that whichever direction the average age of company Z is from company, uh, from, from, from the, what the average of the two would be, that's the company that had more people in it because it weighted the average more in that direction. And comparing the two, 26.6 um, is less than 27.5. 26 26.6 is younger than 27.5, which means that the younger committee, committee X, had more people going into com uh, committee Z than, than committee Y did. They skewed the number, they skewed the average of the combined committee younger than what the strict average would be of the two average ages. So the two statements together are sufficient. We can cross off E and circle C, or click it and confirm it if this were the real GMAT. Okay, so that average age stuff was actually going somewhere. It was allowing us to do a weighted average of the um, respective averages. That is enough for today. So um, once again, my name is Jim Jacobson. Thanks for watching the Grocket OG TV program, GMAT edition, cover to cover, question to question, everything in that book with explanations and occasional artwork, usually triangles, but sometimes smiles. And here, a first time you saw a smiling triangle. So um, tune in next time. We will pick up on page 285 with question number 142. And... Um, you know, we will be uh, not be broadcasting for a couple of the, the holidays, but for the most part, we'll be with you the whole time. So um, hope to see you around next time.